Going on everybody, I said, yeah, an invite, so I don't know why I didn't get through. Invites. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. Okay, I got to figure out how to make you bigger. There's something I got to play with. Well, I figured out how I can be on it, so that's really all that matters. I don't care how big I am. Well, if I get other people on here, I'd like them to be bigger, but I don't know how to do that. Well, see, that's where you're supposed to ask a Tiki Talk famous person. Oh, wait, that's you. Sure. You're the Tiki Talk guy in our group. Maybe I got a host. I don't know. Hold on here. Watch this. Um, no, that shuts me off. Maybe it's a... Uh, no. Modify. No. Yeah, it's all on your end. What's up, guys? Hey, Todd, or Brian... <laughs> Illinois Blues Brothers are in here. That'll work. We'll do it like this. It don't matter. If somebody else wants to jump, look, there's somebody else. They jump in right there, so that works. What's up, up Kevin? It's one of my pro staffers right there, Mr. Illinois Blues Brothers. Oh, well, hello there, Illinois Blues Brothers. How we doing? be doing so we're just kind of here to take questions talk about catfish techniques about how we love to run our lovely santee rigs so if anyone's got questions feel free to ask try to answer them. when i said that one of yours was really close that's oh yeah that's that uh <laughs> What do we call that one, Sasquatch? That's not one of mine. He hasn't gotten mine yet. Oh. I thought that was the orange and black and white spotted thingy that I lost. Nope. That one's from uh, Mayhem Tackle here in mm -hmm. Illinois. Hell yeah. <clears throat> Our hooks are pretty similar, too. Now we run them fishing frenzy hooks, which I think he's in here. His backup counts in here. Yeah, Glenn said he'd be in right there. He's fishing twelve watt uh, Sasquatch cat call, and then dirty South dragon weight. <clears throat> you wanting to jump in the box there, fish frenzy? I can send you an invite. Ben's always got something nice to say. I can figure out how to invite him. <laughs> there we go. Well, I sent you the invite. Yep. If you guys don't know, we run anti Cooper rigs with spooks, cat calls, whatever you want to call them. We run a fishing frenzy hook, normally 10 to 12 off, up smaller. We can catch anything from what, three pound channels up to 40 pound flatheads. Yeah. No issues. No one no here. No. I remember the last time you were doing a <clears throat> catfish and talk, you had said you'd never heard of anybody running double rattles. I see that. I, that blows my mind. Yeah, I see it more and more on TikTok. On TikTok, 
So I see, yes, on social media, I see it more and more. I don't do it very often, but when nothing else is working, I'm willing to try just about anything I have to. Ain't nothing wrong with that, brother. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Yeah, you got you to be able to adapt. I just, I think I've I'm seen guys that. running. I've seen guys running two rattles, a spook and a rattle, two spooks and a rattle, a spook and two rattles. It's uh, it's almost like they're um, oh, what's it called when you wear a bunch of jewelry? You're accenting, and they're accenting their stuff. And it, hey, if it catches you fish, it works. It works. It works. These are hey, what up, fishing frenzy? I was telling you about the other night too. They're nice and skinny. More Glenn, what you been up to? A, a cheap little Rattles swivel on the top that breaks. So all you lose nine times out of ten is your sinker and not your entire rig. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's nice. Just don't forget the plug in the boat. Yeah, always make sure you got your uh, plug in the boat. I've only done that once. Speaking of that, hey, we did go pick up that boat tomorrow, bub. So let's uh, get right into this uh, catfish stuff. Do we all run our leader through our eyelets, or do we make separate knots? Running straight through the eyelet. I don't want an extra fail point. Straight through the knot. Straight through. No knot. What's that? Straight through. No knots. No breakage. What I pound test? Roll. 50 to 80. What pound test? My Andy's line, line right Andy's there. 60. What about you, Glenn? 80. 80. See, we all... Big, big diameter, big, heavy line mono. Now, in a lot of people's eyes, I do things backwards. My leader line is quite a bit heavier than my main line. Been there. Yep. I run a, typically a 60-pound leader with a 40-pound main. Now, see, I can, do, I can see doing that if you're one of those you need to get to really far out casts and also want to have a lot of line on your reel. Uh, the we two got, rods I got sitting main, here, I think I'm yeah. sitting at 600 foot. Yeah, it's a lot more than us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But you got to think, when I'm dragging planer boards, I typically run... A hundred foot of line, put the planer board another hundred foot of line. If that bread was to break for whatever reason up close to the boat, I'm already out to almost 200 foot worth of line. I don't want to have to re spool a rod every time I break. Very true. Blaze tackle, four pound four carbon. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm sure we all use the bigger, heavier line because what? We don't want to fight these fish. We don't want to spend. 30 minutes getting them in, right? We want to get them in, catch, photo, release, get them back in the water, correct? Pretty much. Yeah. So the heavier gauge tackle, you know, once you get in above that 20-pound limit, do you guys, do? does any of the catfish species really take effect to it? Not that, I mean, do I they... Mean the quicker you can get them back in the water, obviously, the better. But what I'm saying, you don't <laughs> find fish that shy away because you're using a heavier gauge leader, right? No, not at all. I mean, a twenty a twenty pound fish isn't going to notice the floss in between its in it in between its lips, right? Well, and even with that being said, I mean, I run Nocturnal Nation hooks, and there's times I'll be running this Lucky Thirteen right here, which is an absolutely humongous hook. Yeah. And I'll still catch two three pound channels on it. Yeah, yeah. We run fishing frenzy twelve aught hooks. Well, Glenn, right up there. We run the fishing frenzy twelve aught hooks, and we've caught everything from three pound channels all the way up to yeah forty pound flatheads on the same exact hook. Our twelves are pretty close to their lucky thirteens, though. 
Yeah, it's a big yeah, oversized okay. gap. I mean, the, my common size for the lake that we typically fish, I typically just run the 10 hot raptors. Uh, now, if we go to our lake down in Springfield that's known for the giant blues, then we'll start breaking out a little bit big, bigger hooks, start throwing bigger chunks of bait. So, yeah, that's their tw his 12 watt. <clears throat> yeah, I run that for everything, whether it's channels, flatheads. So, yeah, you got yep. 10 out in the front, 12 out in the back. <laughs> Blaze says there's nothing wrong with a 15 hour fight. If you're eating the fish, there's not. But if you're trying to put the fish back in the water and catch it again, there is. Yeah, that's our thing is we want to get those fish back in the water as fast as possible or we want to, you know, get them weighed in as fast as po possible. Because I know I know you guys were in those, tur you know, the, like the 12-hour tournaments and you got those fish in there, your live well, for a while, right? Uh, we've actually had it during a tournament to where we had a fish – no, it was, it was only about a 15, 16 pound blue, but that's pretty common for our lake. It's about the average. Would not stay right in the live well, kept going belly up, thinking we were going to lose it. So I naturally said, I'd rather go in with two, two fish versus chance and lose this one. The minute I threw that thing in the lake, it acted like nothing was ever wrong and took off like there was no tomorrow. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Yep. We've seen we've seen Flathead kind of do the same thing. Once you got them in a in a container, they kind of just give up, and they'll start to roll if they're not strong enough. But don't really mean they're going belly up. They're they're just. They're playing possum per se. They're giving up. Pretty but much. But as soon as you drop them in the water, they're. I've had some yeah. do the same thing with the calling system. Put the calling system on them, they'll go belly up. You take it off, they'll sit right. Yep. Uh, we don't use none of that. Yeah, but uh, it's the same thing. Yeah. But you got to think an animal. It's an animal. It's, it, it has a psychology. It feels trapped. If it feels trapped and it's not, it thinks life's over, you go belly up. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, all, do we all use uh, some type of dragon weight or drifting sinker, or do you guys use different types of sinkers for different I type run, of bottom? If I'm trolling, I'm always running the structure snakes. Now I keep the old school pencil weights just in case I was to run out of my dragon weights, but I despise these pencils compared to the structure snakes. <clears throat> the only other time I'll change it up is if I'm actually anchored off. I'll I'll run the flat teardrops. So you fish from a boat mainly then? Yeah. And what, what do you fish in a river or a lake, high current, low current? It's a lake that has low current. So the two lakes that we fish around here are both power plant lakes. So they're I mean the water's always moving, but it's not a huge flow. Hell yeah. And I know, Glenn, you fish from a boat quite often, also from a, a river, Maumee River, correct? Yeah, usually the boat, sometimes the bank, it just depends. But you're fishing in a high we current situation boat. most of the time. Most of ours is a decent current. You get some flooding, we get a high current where 16 ounces is hard to hold sometimes. That's just ridiculous to me. That's why you get a bait runner. So we what did you bank last year during the flood? We we did bank last year during the flood, and I threw eighteen ounces, and it was still dragging. That's just insane. What I've got type a of reel were you? Using? Sinker in the boat, and I can't even fathom trying to throw it out. Oh, that Mad Cat throws it just fine. It had yeah. four of them on it, but it throws it just fine. <laughs> <laughs> now, what type of reel do you use there, Illinois? I run, so my rods all have the Daiwa AccuDepths. So a bait caster. Yep. And then my wife's got uh, the Okuma Coldwaters. Oh, yeah. 
What about you, Fish and Frenzy? What kind of reels you running this year? Most all of mine are still the uh, big game pro. They all have the bait clickers on them. Spinning. Spinning. I know Sasquatch, you run them both bait casters and bait runners, right? Yep. See, I'm 100%. I run a bait runner. It's 90% of the time either a Kuma Seymour or a Shimano or a, uh, a Kuma CDX80. I got a couple of Iowa Regals. Yep. I don't like the I Avenger. Actually, I actually bought my oldest a Daiwa spin cast this year, and that thing is – it's impressive. Daiwa and Pin have really stepped up their game as well, and Akuma. Daiwa, Pin, and Akuma within the, the saltwater versions of the bait casters and the bait runners, they've really stepped up their game in the last couple of years. My thing is, is I'd already had two of the silver AccuDepths, and I'd had it for like six years, never even been cleaned or nothing, and it was still doing just fine before I sent it off to get cleaned and upgraded. I'm like, as good as these have performed, I'm just going to buy two more. Yeah, the pin 20 LWs. Yeah, I know a lot of guys running them Sasquatch. Well, yeah, when you can put over 200 yards of a 100-pound braid on it. <laughs> yep. I can get close to 200 on my, my 80 series here. Now, do you guys run braid or mono mainline? I run mono. I typically run slime line, main line. Biggest reason I run the slime line <laughs> is the visibility of it with my UV lights at night. Oh, God, I hate that name. All right, yeah, I can't hate you for it. It's what you like. What slime about you? <coughs> catch, hey, slime line is catch the fever, not who yeah. you're thinking of. No, I know it's catch the fever, but you know how I feel about slime line. It has that pop tendency. Slime line doesn't stretch nearly as well as that sea quatcher, I think. That's all we run right there. Reaction tackle? Reaction 80 pound. Yep. I like running nice suffix 832, the gore. I I it's the high dollar stuff, but I, I swear by it. Yeah, this year I switched over to that canine braid. Once I'm and they make a nice black light. That stuff glows under a light. Yeah, I'll give that. That canine braid glows, and it's a nice round braid. It's it's very soft. So I used to run yep. braid when I was bank fishing. But once I got the boat and started trolling with it, granted, this is when I very first started trolling for cats, and I didn't know near as much about it as I do now. I was constantly cutting it on the rocks, running them pencil yep. sinkers, yep. which is why I went back to mono. I've heard yep, that we, a lot about it cutting with rocks, and we've never – I mean, we got a lot of structure here, and we've never had an issue with cutting the reaction. I did with the suffix, but not the reaction. I've had many issues cutting it. just all depends. That's why I like to run the Dragon Sink or the Dirty South Dragon Sinkers because it keeps my line a good 12 inches up out of the bottom. No matter where I throw, that sinker stands straight up. So my line's always at least 12 inches up off the bottom. And then, well, I really don't care about it after that. I retie enough. I don't, I don't, I retie every time I go out. Or at least I like to say that and I try to do it. I you probably just should, you but just about across. the only time we retie is going into a tournament. If we're just going out pleasure fishing. I'm not going to retie just to retie, but now if I see obvious nicks and weak points, I will, but unless I see that, I'm not retying. Hi, so you well, fish in a lot of tournaments then? Uh, we typically fish our local series. Uh, last year, Mother Nature wasn't our friend. There was a couple tournaments we kind of skipped out of because there was even sea arcs fishing it that had waves coming over the back and my little 16 foot sea nymph was not going on the lake uh, and then we started fishing a veteran benefit tournament last year down on Lake Springfield 
And this year, my teammate Tom and I are in the process of setting up a benefit tournament for veterans as well. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. That's what it's all about. Veterans, ch- children, handicapped, getting, you know, anybody out there fishing. It's, that's what it's all about. Veterans especially. That, that, that's my second second nature. Youth first and veterans second. Uh, I'm actually Region 5 director with Tackle 22. Hell yeah. Hey, Tackle 22 is some great guys. Let and me know when you 30. do the I'll get you some red, white, and blue hook for it. Okay. Yeah, uh, Fish and Frenzy does a special uh, run, red, white, and blue run. That's pretty damn nice. Tentative date right now is going to be September 2nd. Uh, I'm still trying to find out all the details because the state of Illinois decided to stick their hands where they don't belong last year. You can get uh, around that. Yeah, there's those hooks, the red, white, and blue all the way, red tips. It's the, the the veterans love them. We pair them up with the Mad Cats, Patriots, and whatnot. And, you know, everybody wants matching stuff nowadays. I don't <laughs> – they want to match. But from what I've been told – if it is a benefit tournament, supposedly those are tax exempt. You got to have a nonprofit or you got to have a status to do that. So, yeah, there's ways around it. That's what I'm dealing with here in Ohio. We're not to the bad part of where they're like Illinois are extra looking at everything, but tax laws are the same across the nation. So, in all reality, I should I should abide by the highest regime of the IRS. And anything over six hundred dollars paid out in Ohio, somebody owes taxes on. You know, yep. it's but they just don't go after it nearly as hard as they do in Illinois. Well, from what I've been told, and I don't know if there's any truth to this yet, supposedly Illinois doesn't even have a way set up for them to collect the money. As with most things, they enact the law without being able to enact the enforcement. But I don't want to set up and run my first tournament and be the first first tournament out there to get bit. Which group well, are you doing the tournament with? Um, it's just going to be our team. Uh, so we haven't come up with a name yet, but we're thinking of just doing, uh, calling it the first annual Illinois Blue Brothers tournament supporting Tackle 22. Um, as of right now, um, well, Tackle I'm Twenty Two, not... they're an actual nonprofit. If you team up with yeah. them, they should be able to cover you. Should yes. Yeah. I, I'm waiting on him. For, I I emailed the iFish Illinois today. I'm waiting to hear back on what has to be done for that. I already know that the lake we fish, if it's a benefit tournament, nine times out of ten they waive all activity fees and everything else. So. So let's get in a little bit to what we use as bait. Let's talk about fishing. What do we all choose as bait? Whatever they want. <laughs> What's your first go-to? My first go-to is shad. Uh, I'll run bluegill. I've tried skipjack. I've had luck with skipjack, but they're not natural to our lakes, and I try to stick to whatever is natural to them in that body of water because I seem to be a lot more successful with it. Yep, that's the kind of what we feel. If you don't catch it from the lake that the fish you are hunting for are eating in, well, then you just get lucky. Then you got Brian here. That's a goldfish. (laughs) <laughs> which I can't argue with them because we do use goldfish up here in Indian Lake and it's proven to work when other natural fish don't work. Well, it's kind of like carp. We got a another power plant lake. <clears throat> I'm sure there's carp in it, but they got a bait shop up there and I won't do it just because he's absolutely ridiculous. He almost, I think he's almost up to $10 a carp now. Yeah. But bait fish is getting it, expensive, man. But our go to so are cast nets are getting expensive too though. 
Yeah. <laughs> Our go-to here is sheep head or drum. That, that's my go-to. Drum is one that I've had a lot of good success with. Or uh, I didn't realize we had these in this lake until last year, but I worship them when I catch them. Uh, we've got golden shiners, too. That's what our lake record was caught on this year was the golden shiner. Whenever we catch them, it's called the AKA catfish crack. See, I, when I grew up, dude, we used emerald shiners and creek shiners. That's what my personal biggest is caught on is a creek shiner. And then uh golden shiner is what caught the late record, the lake record last year. So I, shiners my dad are a great bait. Comments, he's not wrong either. Shrimp does work too. If I'm going out for eaters. Yeah, if you're going out for channel cat, shrimp, and just night crawlers, man. Night, you know, just basic liver even. Simple baits for eater-sized fish. I, I have issues with liver. It works, but I'm one of those. I like to try see if I can launch my pole to the other side of the lake. Nine times, nine times out of ten, the liver stays ten foot from the boat. <laughs> Nope, I feel you, man. I run 15, 13, 12-foot surf rods, so I'm all about the cast sometimes. So, Sasquatch, man. let us uh, I know how you mainly fish. You fish with me quite often. Let's get into a, when we choose bait. You know, we, we do a lot of body size, color size. You know, we're very selective about our bluegills, right? Yes and no. Well, okay, we're very selective when we have the ability to be. Yes. I like that six to eight inch size bluegill, depending on the time of year. And but I we're think we're also fishing for flat, flathead, so we use, use them live. We don't normally chunk them up, but if we chunk them up, yeah, normally you want that six to eight inch to get those nice, nice size chunks. And I find well, that something else I've noticed with that too is, you know, a lot of people are, they're dead set on just running gut packs. Yep. There's days that gut packs run great, and there's other days they will not touch it unless it's the head. Yep. Flathead have you ever, all the time. Have you ever tried flapper style? I started messing with it. I actually just heard about it last year, actually running fillets. Yep. Uh, so I started playing with it right at the end of the year last year. I plan on experimenting a lot more with it because we had some of the biggest takedowns we've ever had running fillets. Take a nice big bluegill or a nice big anything, anything you're allowed to use in the hole and simply take the fillets three quarters of the way off so they sit there and flap. And if you're fishing a river or a current or anything, they'll sit there and just flap in your current and spread that scent, spread that, 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 uh, juice, that oil. That's a actual, that's a UK thing. If I could find my book, it's, it's something I learned from out of UK years ago. Matt, it, it kind of benefits us since Ohio has the regulations where if they have a size limit or a slot limit, you cannot use yeah. them as unless they are whole. So essentially, we can take a nine-inch crappie and flapper it out because it's still whole, and use it legally. Or we can take a twelve-inch bass, flapper it out, and still use it. But we can't take it and cut it in half, or we can't use it as cut bait. Well, see, and that's where they get us in Illinois with the crappie. You can, if you caught it legally on rod and reel, and it's legal size, you can run it as bait. But yep. The minute you cut it up, it's no longer legal length. Yeah, the minute you cut it, the spine, you shorten the length. You can flapper that son of a bitch by law, though. It's still in the hole. Hi, Maddie. I'm yeah, I might try that technique this year uh, for blues on Hoover with the white bass. Because I noticed white bass or blues love white bass, at least here. I don't know about... With you and your guys with blues over there in Illinois, but blues here in Ohio love white bass. I've wow, really Grindin says he never uses game fish as bait. 
Wow, dude. Why? I got to ask, Grindin. Grindin, why don't you use game fish? Do you realize catfish are eating mainly game fish? They're big, sluggish, high efficiency fish. They want the most now, out of their meals. Where he's at, game fish could be something different. Like, yeah, very Ohio true. Kind of, Ohio can kind of consider bluegill and crappie to be game fish. Some other states don't. Well, even bass, though. Oh, Sasquatch is glitching. Bass are considered pretty much. Who's glitching? Me? Yep. Yep, you. <laughs> but no, grinding. Why do you never? Are you not allowed to use game fish? Yeah, he's really lagging. Big time. My connection shows good. Nope, still in and out. Me? Yep. I'm in and out. I, I don't understand. It shows I have good connection. Hmm. All right. Maybe now that it'll be worked. <laughs> He's the only one I live. See you, Glenn. To... I thought. All right. Good. Yeah. We all agree it's Sasquatch. The host can't have bad connection. <laughs> right. Yeah, he can't swipe out and swipe back in. No. Well, I guess we just... So, what all questions does everybody have? I mean, we got three, four different styles of fishing here. You got a boat fisherman, that's a tournament fisherman. You got Glenn, that's a big river fisherman, that's boat and bank. You have Sasquatch, who is like kind of an all-around fisherman. And then I'm just, I fish from my house. <laughs> so, there's got to be some questions coming up. Hey, if the river was right in my backyard, I'd always be there. Sad thing is, man, right now I can't even bring myself to fish for saw guys, dude. I can't. It's like fall all winter long, and I'm not a fall fisherman. These are a must have for me, too. What's that? What you got? Oh, three, three way swivels. Yeah, those with the beads. Yep. Yeah, Trophy Cat carries them. Uh,. The beads, hey, Florida, not so much or of Alabama, deal, Georgia. But... <clears throat> oh. Okay, so Brian asked, how much different is bank fishing than river boat fishing? Well, I have to say this. Boat fishing is a lot easier in my mind because you can... Try spot after spot after spot after spot. Whereas bank fishing, you kind of got to be in tune to your your surroundings. You got to kind of know where you're fishing because you're going to fish that same spot all night long or maybe just two spots all night long. That was one thing that drove me nuts when I was bank fishing was the amount of stuff I had to carry and pack up just to move spots. Yep. No, we're big gear guys. So we have batteries, lights, chairs, poles, pole holders. Um, dude, we have, uh, we have crock pots if we want them. Well, I mean, you've seen my group of kids, so we got to have a big bank spot if we're all going. Well, I've also seen your boat. You'll put a TV and a grill up on your boat. Yep. <laughs> Ain't nothing Kids wrong with got that. A TV, TV on there, got a, a black stone on the front. We've been making steaks out there. Hell yeah. There's Jason. Jason's in the house. Uh -oh. 
I mean, I don't go as far as a Blackstone, but I'll bring my Coleman stove and stuff out on the boat. Well, we fish. I got a lot of home, uh, I got a 30-foot pontoon, so. Yeah, you got a and lot we more fish real estate feet than feet I do in, a, in, in my 16-foot <laughs> Starcraft. Yeah, me and Sasquatch will fish 40 feet from the house sometimes, so it's we're a little spoiled. Yeah. <laughs> Like, literally be right here, behind this door. The lake's right... The lake's right there. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, Tosh lives on his own little island. <laughs> Especially during the winter. Not all the residents are around there. Yeah, it's fun during the winter yeah, because nobody's fun. here, but during the summer, I could kill half my neighbors. <laughs> That's kind of like growing up. It was like when I grew up, my dad and I would go over to my grandfather's, throw all the flags and stuff out on the lake, and then go back in and sit in the camp and watch them from inside. Yeah, oh, I've done that many times. Many, many times. <laughs> Hell yeah. So uh, let's, let's get into some... Tournament fishing. You're a tournament fisherman. Glenn, you've hosted tournaments. Sasquatch, yeah. you fish bass tournaments and you host tournaments. And, well, I gave up tournament fishing and I just host them. So, what? I'll be honest. I don't fish them for the money. If I did that, I needed a new hobby. I don't <laughs> think anybody fishes them for the money. You'd be stupid, too. I mean, we did take third place in one of them last year, and that was a messed up tournament. <clears throat> we did not, it was an eight hour tournament, did not catch a single fish for seven and a half hours. Yeah. And we caught three good blues in the last 20 minutes of the tournament and took third. Yeah. So, why do you get in the tournaments then? <laughs> Well, the lake we fish, we knew there was bigger fish in there. We could not figure out what we were doing wrong to get past all the channels. So we're like, heck with it. We're just going to start fishing tournaments, get in with the right guy, try to learn some different stuff. Then it just kind of turned into, okay, we love the camaraderie. We've made a lot of good friends. Now we just enjoy going out once a month, fishing with everybody we know and have a good time. Camaraderie. So, uh, Sasquatch, you know, I know your dad's a big bass tournament fisherman. You fish in a lot of tournaments with him. What's your drive to fish in tournaments? Because we fished in tournaments together, but now we host tournaments. And there's not really, I know you kind of want to get any more next year, but what's your drive for it? Because I really have zero drive to get in any tournaments anymore. I think it's got to deal with the camaraderie thing and also being able to learn new stuff. Because you're going to always learn something from someone. And it could just change your outlook on how, how you fish. Now, I'm not going to lie. I've got a couple guys that fish our tournaments. I keep threatening to throw some Apple Air Tags in their boats. But... Hey, we, you know, whatever works. <laughs> we got a couple of them. They just absolutely slay every tournament they go to. And, of course, I've become good friends with them, so I joke with them, be like, one of these days when you're not looking, I'm just going to throw an Apple Air tag in your boat, and I'm going to figure out where you're catching these fish every single tournament. Oh, yeah, it's easy. Yep, yep. yep. you got to turn the locations what? off on of photos, too. So, Glenn, I know you more sponsor and host tournaments than rather than get in them sometimes, but you are known to get in them. What's uh, your your thoughts on this whole this? new age tournament and whatnot world at first it was kind of just to get everybody together get more people out fishing um it was more for fun not about the money and anymore it's just some of the tournaments we stopped doing it after three years there was just too many people too much drama it just it was too much so we stopped doing it we said we'd never do it again 
Well, we've so, got yeah, that going on with our series now. <clears throat> it's up in the air whether or not it's going to happen this year just because the directors are tired That's of a couple you, people. Jason. and Sorry. Just, just kind of over the drama. Yeah. No, there's lots of drama right now. I mean, dude, everything catfishing got dramatic for a little while. Everything was dramatic. And a yeah, lot of it that I noticed your was, and... a lot of it that I noticed was people just hating on everybody because they didn't all use the same stuff. But I here's don't care what thing. you use. Here's the sad thing. Ninety percent of what we all use comes from the same country. I don't care if you buy, where you buy your stuff. I don't care. Me and Sasquatch can prove to you 90% of all tackle coming into America comes out of the same country. Even the rod blanks. Yes. Most 90, of them are the yes. same thing. 100%. Yes. Yep. Talk I've got one man. rod that <clears throat> I've got one rod that I won't use, but I've got my own reasons to that. And it was how I was, I guess, for lack of a better term, done. And the minute it happened, everything I had with that company name, I sold it. Because it upset me instantly. And I get that. <laughs> you got to use what's right for you and what you, makes you feel warm and fuzzy, as they say. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'd love to run meat hunters or something like that. But we run Tangling with Catfish Rods, which is based out of Springfield, Illinois. The good rods, too. rods. I absolutely yeah. love them. The only part I'm salty about, it's jokingly salty, but they were getting ready to unveil the orange rods when we bought ours. <clears throat> My teammate Tom, he's an orange freak or a green freak, so he was all about the green rods. I'm an orange freak and I was wanting the orange ones. He goes, yeah, it's going to be a couple months before they're unveiled and, you know, ready for order. I was all right. Well, I'm not going to wait a couple months to go fishing. I'll just buy the green ones. No big deal. Three weeks after I bought them, they got posted on their Facebook ready for order. Yeah. I'm like, this Ronald sucks. Martin says, that's why tackle stinks, buddy. I'm telling you, if you're buying tackle from the wrong place, it stinks. Buy tackle from a local business who is doing mass orders, but they're going through their stuff before they sell it to you because really quality is on the incoming. I'm a quality engineer in my professional day life has nothing to do with fishing has nothing to do with whatever, but I can tell you incoming quality is key in every manufacturing industry. So if you think tackle stinks, I hate to say, man, you're, you're, you're dealing with the wrong people because 90% of our tackle is coming out of the same country. I hate to say. I, I actually need to go down and see him and try to help figure out some flatheads down there in Kentucky with him. He just moved down to Kentucky a couple of years ago. It's actually my dad. Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah, Kentucky is a river. You do good in rivers. He's got a river like less than a quarter mile from his house. Yes. Yeah. And just that's where you start. I think that's where we all started is just going to a small little creek and river. That that probably wouldn't hurt, Dad. You could probably use some new equipment. Me too, Rob. Me too. I'm ready for some spring fly heads. What's up, Big Rob? Big Rob. Yeah. Uh, Ohio loco, local, he's uh, down in, yeah, he is Ohio loco, <laughs> but he, he fishes the Ohio here. River area. He came up here to the shop. Hell yeah. Yeah, I, I talked him into coming up to Indian Lake for some spring flatheads. Yeah, that's, uh, dude, springtime is where it's at up here at the lake. Yeah. You're talking about 15, 20 fish nights on, yeah. on flatheads. Yeah. <laughs> That's the one fish I have yet to successfully Wait, land. One, I've two. tied into one. A flathead? I got it. And I've gotten it all the way to the boat just to realize I left my net at home, put my hand in its mouth, 
and it spun through my hand one way, the hook the other way, and it was every bit of 30. And my wife has yet to let me leave it down, live it down because she was with me. Dude, flatheads to me is the gold. They're in our lake. They're just hard to come but, by. But you're yeah. also in a lake that's overpopulated with flatheads, too, there, Tosh. <laughs> well, you Still say up. that, but if you were to ask our DNR around here, they say they can't believe that people aren't bringing in three bag limits of them to our tournaments because there's supposedly so many of them in the lake. So let me ask you Live a few things. Bluegill. Hold on. Let's let's get into this then. Let me ask you a few things. I noticed things that people do that will attract blues and they think they want to fish for flats. Do you use more cut bait than live bait? If I'm flat fishing, no, it's live bait. Okay. Do you fish currents or still waters more for flats? Our whole lake's pretty much still water, so I, I, for me, it's lake flats, not river flats. I know, but when you fish lakes, do you look for the seams on the top of the water and the eddies in the top of the water where the current is flowing through for the wind? I fish what I've been told is the most common to find them in our lakes, and that's the real brushy coves. Nope. Nope. In lakes, flatheads are not a structured catfish it is good to fish structure but you fish structure from a boat straight up and down you want to fish nice big bodies like lakes for flatheads fish in between the dens fish in the highway where the wind is blowing a seam where the current is pulling a seam where something is pulling a seam because just like in rivers, flatheads will go up and down the river, but they go back to den every day or every morning. In the lakes, they go out and they prowl. And we've seen them outside of our uh, seawall with the spotlights. They cruise. They cruise up and down, just like a channel cat would. They're not sitting so much like a river flathead would with just waiting to ambush. They're out on the prowl. Now, we do have the hot water discharge, yep. which there's been a couple good ones pulled out of there. But the problem is, is if you don't catch one or anything in the first 15, 20 minutes, your bait's dead. Yeah. It does not matter how or where you hook it. The water is so warm, your fish yep. is dead. I had one yep. night. I went through 27 bluegill in there. Granted, I caught a fish on every single one of them, but every one of them was a channel, and it was all on live bluegill. No, there's warm water inlets or hot water discharges. Those are good places to target for catfish. But you're right. It, it's a very swap and trade bait area. You only got a limited amount of time. So, yeah. getting into tournaments then, though, we're hosting about five tournaments. Uh, Glenn, are you hosting any tournaments this coming year? We thought about maybe doing, like, a, a more of a charity-type tournament or something maybe towards the end of the year. But, I don't know, we just paired up. We're, we're an ambassador now for Catfish for Heroes. So, we're working with those guys. So, we may do something maybe towards the end of the year to try to benefit them. But I just have to see how the year goes. Hell yeah. Now, and you said you guys are trying to host a tournament with Tackle 22? Yeah, we're looking at <clears throat> right now September 2nd when we're hoping to have it. Hell yeah. I've already got a couple things lined up for raffle sponsors. Uh, Nick Nax is sponsoring us with one of his big cutting boards. Uh, Joey Middleton's going to send out some bait towels, it sounds like. Oh yeah. Not that I don't have enough of them to start with, but I'd be lucky if I can find half of them. <laughs> yeah, I'm in that same boat. I just had to rent a whole other story. We, <clears throat> Tom and I actually talked tonight, and I think whatever he sponsors, we're going to match it in an order. That way, every single boat leaves with a bait towel that's got our team logo on one side and the Tackle 22 fishing on the other. Oh, yeah. 
Hell yeah. That's the way to go, man. That's a put promotion, promotion, promotion. That's the way to do it. I mean, we have an actual team. We have a logo. We're by no means professionals. We just enjoy it. Last year, we decided why not just make an actual team out of it. There was a couple of people that were talking about making one around here, and we're like, why not? Is there really anything, though, as a professional fisherman? I mean, is there a such thing in all honesty? Okay, I'll, I'll rephrase that. I'm not, I'm not out there fishing professional series tournaments like Cat Masters, Cabela's King Cat. I know guys that do, and they still work 40-hour jobs, and, and they're still as tight on money as every other guy out there. That's why, I mean, I really don't see any, there's no professional, true professional cat fishermen that are making a living catfishing. The people that are making a living in the catfish industry, they're selling the tackle. Hey, I know somebody that begged to differ on that. <laughs> My dad's okay, not but... wrong with that. Not <laughs> professional, just dedicated. I know you may know somebody that may be beg to differ, but how much did they make in comparison? Oh, you know who I'm talking about. I'm not saying anybody, but yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing. Yeah, somebody can make a nice thirty, forty thousand dollars a year, which that's good money. But in all reality, in this day and age, you need more than that. Nobody is fishing full time and making a million dollars. No, but I, I think the way the catfish industry has been growing the last couple of years, you give it a couple of years and it's, it's going to be huge. I still think it's like the gold rush. The people that are making the money, they're the ones bringing the product to the table. See, my th I, I used to do a lot of bass fishing. I really don't anymore. I might do it once or twice a year. My thing with the cat fishing, A, I kind of remember going out as a kid with my dad to private ponds and stuff and seeing what he was catching. And I thought it was cool back then. And when I moved back out here, I'm like, I'm going to give it a shot. Well, once I got into it, I started enjoying the fight from the catfish more than I do the bass. And the bigger they got and the bit better the fights got, the more I wanted. And now I'm just kind of addicted to it, for lack of a better term. Yeah, Fish in Alabama, George Lyons says he makes $300 monthly. I Native. spend more than that on bait <clears throat> monthly sometimes. He says he makes I mean, negative $300 monthly. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, there you go. That's true. That's the truth. I mean, when you're talking $100 rods, $200 reels, is anybody really making any money? Honestly, we're just feeding our addiction. Well, that's kind of hey, like these reels here. Jump these were 120 bucks when I bought them. Then I turned around and spent another 50 bucks upgrading them on top of Eighty-five, ninety-dollar rods. I mean, it adds up quick. Oh yeah. And then ain't nobody just got one, two, three setups. Most of us have way too many. Yeah, it's like these sinker, these my drift yeah. sinkers. These are three dollars and twenty-five cents a piece for a three ounce. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that's been the same thing right here. These are. Right there is like $120 worth of sinkers. You know? The stuff's not cheap when you start to get into it. You know, you, you figure in your spook, <clears throat> your dragging weight, and like with me running Nocturnal Nation hooks, you break off one time and figure out how much money you lost. Oh, yeah. Yep. Especially if you have your sinker, your slide, your swivel, your your spook, you know, your hook. It yeah, that's actually, seven, eight dollars, nine dollars, ten dollars if you buy it a wholesale, twelve dollars if you buy it off a of buddy. You know, it's kind of like uh, how you guys were talking about heavy running, heavy lines, and everything else earlier. My teammate couldn't make it to a tournament, so I posted on the tournament page anybody. 
looking to fish the tournament, need a partner. This old timer said, yeah, I'll come fish it with you. Never met the guy a day in my life. He showed up with, and I'm not judging him for it. It's just what they looked like. They looked like about a Walmart quality rod. Cat he Daddy said, I packed myself as a pro angler doing local tournaments 2001 to 2002 and wrote it off as, in my taxes. Yeah, I tried that. That's why I formed the nonprofit because I need a business to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he but did he was, it as himself, like right, writing off all of his expenses, like every like tournament entry fee or, and stuff like that. I'm thinking is what he's saying. Even then, though, I can't factor in that much money. <laughs> yeah, <I'd> <laughs> he was running. <laughs> <laughs> he was running double hook rigs, but his trailing hook was a treble hook. Stinger rig. And I'm like, you really don't want that trolling. No. He goes, oh, I do it all the time. Well, coincidentally, some way, somehow, we both got snagged on the same tree. He's doing everything he can. I shut the trolling motor off. He, long story short, he wound up breaking his rod in half. As well. If it's that snagged, I wonder what I'm going to do. Granted, I had my TWC rods, my heavy line. The look on that man's face when I brought the tree to the boat was priceless. <laughs> What's going on, David? Another pro staffer in the house. It's day day. No, We've I've done noticed that, that too. A lot of... We've done that a number of times. I've I've... With my pontoon being 30 feet, we've snagged up before, and everybody says just break the line. I'll pull the pontoon to the snag. As my as my buddy says, I will pull the plug out of that lake before I deliberately cut my line. Yeah. No, I make sure I break I make sure if I'm breaking off, I'm giving it all my fucking effort. I'm breaking off. Yep. yep. We only broke what's off sad one. is I've broken off a few times, and guys have found because we're only a fifty-two hundred acre lake, and I fish quite heavily. But guys have found my rigs, and then they put them back on their pole, and they'll catch fish and bring it in the way and in the way station. <laughs> yep, we've had that happen before. Yeah, Chan, uh, Chandler Fiddler, uh, he found one of the only spooks that Sasquatch had made. He made like three of them or something. And I broke off one night and it was floating out there and he picked it up, but he put it underneath the bobber, ran it totally wrong way. I would never have ran it this way, but he ran it this way and he came in and weighed in a nice 20 pound fish. I've actually talked to some guys, uh, the certain lakes, they cannot run pink bobbers because the blues will just come up and shatter them on the surface. Yeah. Yeah, that's why when I've heard that about blues also, that's why I've always said if you're running with blues or want to fish, you want that high fluorescent, high silver, high pinks, high yellows, high reflective, just you want that 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 contrast. As I was telling Sasquatch, a lot of ours for whatever reason, the lake we mainly fish, orange seems to be the best color we run. I've yeah, tried think... blues, purples, and they just, nothing compares to the orange. I think with our flatheads, red. If we go for a primary color, red seems to be the one that they go for. I don't know why. Wow, dude said he breaks off two times a trip. Really? Yeah, that's that's uh, Avis. He fishes a lot of rivers and a lot of snags. A lot of snags. I like hey. break off four <laughs> times a year. <laughs> well, he's down in uh, he's down in Alabama fishing uh, Catahoochee and West Point. Bring me down there. I'll help you learn how not to snag. <laughs> Snagging is an engineerical <laughs> problem. If you're snagging, there's a problem with the engineering of your rig. Big Rob, just hit me up anytime, bud. 
Hell yeah, dude. When you, Indian Lake's the way place to be in the spring, I'll tell you what. Oh yeah. My issue is with getting snagged is there's just there's a couple spots we know we shouldn't be, <laughs> we but they always produce good quality fish. So we get stupid and try to drag them anyway in hopes that the fish gets it before the trees do. Hell yeah. So fishing Alabama Jordan, how do you have you ever used a in and out hook set where you bury your tip of your hook just like a swim bait on the side of a bluegill? You don't do it from the top, you don't do it from the tail, you do it from the side, and just like you'd bury a swim bait hook, you bury your hook that way and have the tip. You ever try that? I think his problem is the weights more than the hooks. Yeah, if you're using the wrong weight, you always get snagged. Uh, he just fishes a very snaggy part of the river, but that's where all the fish are. Yeah. Flathead is fishing structure you'll easily get snagged in. And 90% of the time, you are correct. Flathead will be in structure, but, but there is this big but. Flathead roam to feed. In the rivers, they will roam very shallowly and very shortly. But in lakes like ours and lakes with certain, like, idle current, they actually roam quite a good distance to feed. Yep. So I like putting our bait right in the, well, if you look out front of our seawall, we have what's called a seam. You can see where the wind blows the top of the water through a seam and the uh, undercurrent pulls towards the spillway at the opposite direction. We we like putting our bait right on the edge of the seam, right in the middle of the seam. Shoot, we had bodies, cars, and fence. Yeah, I for, yeah. <laughs> you go uh, catfishing and you pull up Betty in a fucking Buick and you wonder what the hell's going on. Yeah, I, think I mean that's one just cost me to do more this year is more river flathead targeting. I plan on it Lake, in the GMR though. Get on my boat. He said he was going to come up here and boat fish with me. He hasn't made it up here yet. I got to go pick <laughs> up a boat tomorrow. Then I'll the never lake fish. I want to target this year's the lake we got down in Springfield. It's known for big blues. <clears throat> Uh, we fished it for the very first time this year doing a veterans tournament. Very first fish we caught missed big fish of the tournament by 0. 0.3 freaking pounds. And naturally, it was the last boat to weigh in that beat us. Uh, <clears throat> but they've had three fish bags on that lake that were 211 pounds. That's a that's a pretty big bag there. Yeah, the way we, me and Tosh run our tournaments, uh, bring your biggest fish tournament. So, and it's uh, way in pretty much any time we do normally do what twelve hour, either twelve hour tournament or we do uh, forty eight hour, and then we have one seventy two hour tournament, and you can fit no twelve hour thirty six or seventy two. Yeah. 12 hours, 36 or 72. You can come weigh your fish in anytime. Way station is open 24 hours a day. We encourage you to catch, rush in, weigh in, go back out. Yep. Ours you know, are all three fish bags, but what we've got going for us is a lot of us. I'll be the first one to admit I haven't gotten that high tech yet, but. I keep close tabs on my life. Well, yeah. uh, a lot of our guys are starting to run oxygen systems with timers on them. Yeah, you got. I mean, you almost got to in the summer. Well, it's like at our hot water discharge, the hottest water I have ever recorded on my fish finder in the heat of the summer was 115. Oh yeah. Damn. <laughs> yeah, that's yep. warm. <laughs> we started our tournament. Somali and microwave fish at that temperature. 
<laughs> Those fish are coming out pre-cooked. We start our tournament with a minimum of 50 pounds of ice in the live well. See, we always push for we want a regenerative system in your in your live well or in your transport tank. Something that's flushing the oxygen and pushing the oxygen across the gills. And you want it at equivalent to the same temperature the lake is. So I'm doing some modification to our live well system that we weigh in because I felt that in August in our big tournament, it was inadequate for the hot months. So we're going to do a three phase drip system that will temper the water down, I think, and hopefully, hopefully allow us a lot more recovery because I we can all agree. Come up with a system that pulls water directly out of the lake and then dumps yeah. it right back in. And then, yes. And then you chill it or cool it based yeah. on where it's at in the, in the system. But, uh, yeah. our biggest tournament is in August. It's in the worst time of the year. And we all got to agree post mortality post catch mortality is real you know and no matter how many fish you release alive a certain percentage of them will pass and that's what we're all trying to eliminate we're all trying to minuscule that post release mortality and in all reality i mean that's that's the negative side of fishing i mean it's it's a hard side and in our like it gets a lot of attention because they see five or six nice size flathead floating through one little channel and people want to complain but what they don't realize is we weighed in a hundred flathead that day you know we weighed our in lake 100 sees a lot of it too because they're they're trying to grow our blues population the blues have only been in this lake for like nine years and they're trying to get it to where it's known for a big blue destination Sounds like yeah. Uber. Uh, if, and I think this rule ought to be this way for any tournament, and I think it is for probably about 90 to 95% of them. If you have one deceased fish within your boat, it's automatic disqualification. Yeah, see, I would love to do that, but we've been so traditional. The tournament me and Sasquatch hosts has been going on for 28 years, so much three decades. And it was common until we took it over. It was common to have people bring in flatheads on the back of tailgates dry. And on a stringer. And on a stringer behind boats. Yeah. And yeah. that's where we're really trying to, to educate, educate the locals and realize, you know, you got you to gotta have a live well. You got to have a transport tank. You got to have something that'll keep the. We're not a deep lake, so we don't need the oxygen. We're not pulling fish up from 40, 50 foot deep, but we are pulling them up in warm waters. My average trying, depth that I catch mine is 15 to 19. See, that's deeper than our whole lake. Our whole lake at the deepest point is like 12 foot. Yeah. Average, lake, average depth of Indian Lake is like six to five foot. And it's got 40 plus pound flatheads in it. So the flatheads are just thriving. And now that we have that stupid spillway, they're not rolling over the edge and going into GMR anymore. Yeah. 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 We don't hit that deep out here. We're average eight, eight feet, 10 feet. You'll hit some 15, 16 foot spot. But the whole river out here, there's probably six. On the whole river, that's 14, 15 feet deep. That's it. We got quite a few spots on ours that are about 40, 36 to 40 foot. We got one spot that we call the hills. You can literally watch it on the fish finder. It literally all the way across that section of the lake. And I tell you what, if anybody that likes catfishing, you better be there early because you ain't getting a spot. Hmm. Yeah, I know no. Hoover. Hoover's got 60 foot is the deepest at Hoover, which is a local reservoir near me. And it's known for blue cats. And the wintertime, that's where the blues are, is in that 60 foot water, even though the lake's been dropped 10 feet. Where most of the people catch them. That's 30 to 60 foot of water range is where they catch them this time of year. But they're now, the hottest. 
Go ahead. Go ahead. Our hottest time of the year, I get as close to the power plant as possible just to get to the coldest water on the lake. See, we don't have a power plant on Hoover. That's the sad thing. It gets cold, and that's when, like I was going to say, I I, I don't want to argue with Sasquatch, but most of the people catch blues when it's cold up there. You don't see it like – it's not on the regular. I, and it's because the lake is a 9-9 motor lake. It's hard to access. It's very cut off. I think there's bigger blues than most people have ever caught in there but nobody runs the gear tackle or has the ability to catch them. I, from what I heard, the they, just ran, <clears throat> they just ran nets in ours, D and R did, and supposedly they found a couple 60s. So ours are starting to. But from what I was told, those were found in a location that's not fishable, and they don't know if they're coming out of that area. Yep. We got to see, though, if it's a fish that's eaten a lot, Blues and flatheads will gain three to five pounds per year. So, very true. I mean, we've and only got to think a blue cat and a flathead can lie dormant in a den for three or four years before they actually decide to go out and trek around and find a new den. If they find a big enough area and they made upright every year. They could travel less than two miles. Yep. Yeah, those those blues very well could be from that lake. And they just, they're just ones that are feeding really well. There's a lake up here in Indiana. I guarantee you they're feeding real well. There's a lake up here in Ohio called C.J. Brown. uh, It's a reservoir. And most people will say there's not very many flatheads. There's not very big flatheads. I know guys that will go out there in 40 degree water and use a golden spoon and they'll put 300 pounds of flathead on the boat. It's just those fish are more used to a cold water, cold area, cold habitat. So they stay deeper and darker and they're caught fewer unless you know the exact area and well, the exact placement. Most of our flatheads are either caught by somebody crappie fishing, which that made me sick that morning because we were at the start of a tournament and the guy lifts up a stringer with a 35-pound flathead going, looking for one of these? We actually uh, had that way, way one in. Uh, he, was, he wasn't even fishing for flatheads yet. He was still bait fishing. And he brought he, one. It, one second place. Yeah. He won second place in the annual, and he was bait fishing. Yeah. <laughs> a 30, I want to say it was 33 pounds. I think that's what it was. Yeah. We've got them at our lake that are over 60, and I know that for a fact because I got a buddy that caught one that was 56 pounds, and that was probably four years ago. So let's get into the next thing. Youth fishing. We all support youth fishing, right? So is that like, I mean, do you guys see it in your area? Do you see a decline in the youth getting out there and fishing? Not so much around here. We see, you see a lot of kids out fishing with their parents and stuff. Uh, I don't take her as often as I should. It just depends on who's in the boat with me. But my five-year-old with a short attention span, I'll even take her in the boat. But do you see the parents? Like, I see a lot of parents around. Our, we, I live in a resort area. We have a resort lake. I see a lot of parents that go out, and the kid will be casting. But the parents will be sitting there on the phone on the picnic table just doing this. I won't you say I'm my- on it all the time. I mean, a lot of times if I'm fishing, I'm, go- I'm on live anyway. But... Uh, <clears throat> I can be guilty as charged if ain't nothing biting, but but as my wife put it the other night when we were talking about it, you know, that's our go-to just naturally the way the times have gone. If we're bored, that's naturally our go-to. For us as adults, we have that. 
to where the kids don't. It's not fair to them. I can see that. Because we all are social media fishermen in some way. I mean, look where we're at. Now, you know? I, I'm not going to lie. It might be the most redneck thing you've ever heard of. It may not be. I have a truck bed toolbox that I use for a live well. I will take all my fishing gear out of it, line it with blankets, and come dark, she sleeps in the live well with a lid open. Nothing wrong with that. I, I have four toolbox, four truck toolboxes on my boat, and that's what my kids will do. They'll empty all the life jackets out of them. Two little ones will climb inside of the toolboxes, and they'll pull the door almost all the way down, just not quite closed, and they'll go to sleep. Yep. My biggest thing with our little one, and even my wife would second it, she despises her life jacket. She despises it. And even when she's in that live well, I refuse to let her take it off. Because A, <clears throat> it's state law. And B, if that boat was to go down, I can swim, her mom can swim, I know she can't. And it's trying to find that happy medium of figuring out what it's going to take for her to accept it. I mean, there's a couple times, of course, mine, my life jackets are nothing like hers. I got the pull cords that are non-bulky, but I'll still throw it on from time to time just so she doesn't feel like, well, why do I have to wear it and you're not? All my kids yeah. were like that too. We, we've, we've made them wear them, even if they're gonna lay down and go to sleep. It doesn't matter. We, my two oldest now are finally old enough not to have to, to wear it. Um, but everybody else, we've made them when they were six months old. They still had to wear a life jacket out there, and they've kind of got used to it over the time. So they know the first thing they do when they step on that boat before we leave the dock, they put their jacket on. That's funny because. Well, my uh, business partner, a longtime childhood friend, we grew in, we grew up together. Um, his dad's my landlord. They own two other lakefront houses, and they'll tell you, both of them and their brothers and sisters wore a life jacket in their backyard because they're waterfronts. They wore a life jacket in their backyard until they were like 11, 12 years old. I mean, it was you went outside of your house living on the lake. You wore a life jacket. So, I mean, it's kind of been drilled into a lot of the people around here with kids. I mean, they're going to run around the seawall. They're going to run around the lake edge. You put a life jacket on them. Well, it's like my dad put in the comments earlier. I mean, it, it's how I was brought up. I mean, I didn't necessarily wear a life jacket when we'd go fishing on the river. But you could guarantee when I was a kid, and I was young enough, I barely remember this. He would literally tie a rope around my waist and to a tree to where I couldn't even get on the edge of the water. See, I had a different upbringing. I was born down in uh, Florida. I was born in the ocean. Uh, there's video of, or pictures of me swimming when I was like six months old. So my parents just let me, you want to go swim in that lake? You want to go walk the river? Bye. So I didn't have all that safety precaution, but I do respect it because, you know, I found myself a lot of times in rushing water underneath tree limbs and underneath stuff that it wasn't always that fun. Well, and our lake is a big party boat lake, unfortunately. Yep. And I can't tell you how many times I've either almost been hit which last year actually happened on a veteran trip. The guy knew what I thought about him by the time he got past me. We were dragging baits, and I had two veterans on board, and I literally just about got ran over by a two-story houseboat. Yeah, we have a lot of pleasure boaters on our lake, too. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll just say that. <laughs> We've had a lot of pleasure boaters in Tosh has lost a lot of fishing line because of boaters. Yeah, I've, I've lost a lot of fishing line, and a lot of boaters have paid a great deal to have their lower units replaced. 
I keep a mo- um, I keep a pole with only mono on my boat for that specific reason with an eight ounce cannonball on it. I don't do it with the eight ounce line. cannonball, but I make sure I run a line that any motor is going to wrap my line up. Yep, any motor will wrap me up, and I Sasquatch has watched me. We hold a knife. And we let them take every bit of it, and then when it starts to bend the line, we or when it starts to bend the rod, we slice the line. We let them take everything off the rod. My, Bra- my Braid doesn't do nine. too much damage. Braid doesn't do too much damage, but mono to a prop on there, it turns into hard plastic after it gets hot. Well, yeah, but enough braid will do bend damage to a low rotary like pontoon motor. We had uh, it was a tournament last last year, year before that Tom and I were fishing. We had two wakeboard boats. We were the only ones fishing this area. Only boat down there, and out of nowhere, two wake boats come down, and they were literally going back and forth on one on each side of us, no further than twenty yards off of us. The waves were still so big by the time they got to us, they were coming over the sides of the boat. I was having to pump the boat out every time they went by. Hell yeah. So the next yeah, thing I, I got to get in. Like next thing I got to get into. Local bodies of water. Do you guys mainly fish local bodies of water and know where you're fishing? Or do you venture out there and try to fish new bodies of water? And for the guys that fish local bodies of water... Do you feel that much? I mean, there's always the guys that are going to say, I'm going to travel here and I'm going to win every tournament, or I'm going to travel there and I'm going to win every tournament. You know, we got them all over the nation. They're traveling here, there, and everywhere, thinking that, you know, they're going to take their brand and win every tournament. Are you all cons- – I mean, in my world, locals rule local waters. Do you guys find that to be true? No. No? We got guys that live hour. Well, shoot, we got one guy that fishes our tournaments. He lives three hours away, and there's been tournaments he's put me to shame. Okay, but is he a local in the sense that he fishes your body of water weekly? Uh, no. Okay. He he's more of a river guy. He fishes the Fox River up north. Um. Uh, I mean, even us, I mean, granted, we typically fare well. Uh, just unfortunate for us, if they're paying top three, we get fourth. If they're paying top five, I get sixth. But, you know. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> we started trying to travel different lakes. I mean, we traveled down to that uh, the lake last year to do that veterans event. First time we'd ever been on the lake. And, I mean, we missed biggest fish by 0.3 pounds. Was it luck? I couldn't, I honestly don't know. I mean, we were a little bit salty and said, if you're going to beat me, Waste at least beat me by a bubble cup. <laughs> oh, wait, never mind. Wrong, wrong species. I'm sorry. <laughs> it ain't Lake Erie. You know, that 16 ounce sinker could have come in handy. <laughs> so, here, hold on. Let's touch on that because we all fish for catfish and we all know. You can stick your hand down a catfish's gullet very fucking easily. So how concerned are we all with weights and fish? We're not. And and I think a lot of it kind of goes with, A, I think somebody ratted them out along with suspicions, but. Oh, they were known for at least, I mean, and within the circle, I live in Ohio here and I, I stay up. For two years, they were suspected. Yeah. But you guys know as well as I do, if somebody comes in with a 15-pound fish, you're going to go, eh, that's about 15 pounds. Oh, that's, yeah, that one's about 30. Yeah, we do that live in our group. With me and Sasquatch's tournaments, when we pick up the fish before we put it on scale... Whoever is holding that fish, whether it's me, Sasquatch, or Landon, we give our estimate. Yep. We say, eh, we think it's about 27. Eh, we think it's about... And you know, sometimes we're off a pound or two, sometimes three if it's been a long, long late night. 
but most of us were always pretty right there close on. You're, so. you're within a pound or pound and a half at most. Yeah. Well, I mean, like that, the old timer that was with me that had broke his rod, we caught a blue within the first 15 minutes of the tournament. And he goes, man, that thing looks like it's 30 pounds. I'm like, nah, 12, 13 tops. I was like, the looks of blues is really deceiving because they yeah. they look a lot bigger than what they really are. And sure enough, we got to the weigh in and it was like 12, seven. I think he I goes, think I swore it weighed up. more. I've seen a lot of people do that with it. They'll have a scale. They'll have a flathead. They'll have one hand is all it fits in his mouth. And they're like, this thing's at least 35 pounds. I'm like, you can only get one hand in its mouth. It is not 35 pounds. No. I, I've That's got one of the Whisker Seeker 110-pound right. scales, and it's within <clears throat> 0.3, 0. 0.4 pounds of our tournament scale. So I've typically got a pretty close idea as to what we've got. Yeah, that's the same scale that I run. Yeah, we run a point one or a point oh one by point one scale. So that means it measures down to the one hundredth within the one hundredth. And we've never had a tie. We've never had an issue with the same. I mean, literally the water on the fish will give it a different weight. So it lucky enough to have that you know that specific identification but even then if i pick up a 30 pound fish eight ounces of weight really isn't going to help you at all because somebody's going to turn in a 35 pound fish i mean 12 ounce sinkers in a flathead first off when we pick up that belly we all sasquatch will vouch we pick up our fish in a certain way we it's what we call it, one hand or one fish, two hands, three times as many fish for the future. So you have one fish, you put one hand in its mouth, one hand supporting the belly. You're going to feel anything abnormal, extra heavy weight in that belly. And we do. We check out the fish. We check out the belly. We, you know, it's not just the third in the scale. Yep, there's your weight. Go. Be honest with you, I have a little bit of a passion with these fish, so I kind of want to fondle them before I let them loose. But uh, <laughs> you know, I, I want to get to know this fish. Any any fish anybody weighs in, I want to get to know it. And if I put my hands on it, yeah, I'm I'm feeling its belly. I'm feeling down its throat. There's been times where the second the second place in the annual fish, we found a nice size uh, worm hook that was stuck all the way back in the gill plate. And it had mono leading out the uh, side of the um, the gills. And we were able to, you know, trace that mono back up. And I could find the mono and trace that back to the gill plate and stuck my hand down its gullet and pulled that hook out. So we give that fish a, a nice fondling, I guess you could say. But uh, I well, think we could all... Well, that's something I like about running circle hooks, too. Is you don't have that. You have... You have I can't say I don't because I've been anchored off and, you know, with the kids or whatever, just channel catfishing. I've had some small freaking channels just absolutely inhale a 12 odd hook. Yeah. But uh, at that point, it's a channel and you plan it on bringing it home anyway. So what's the difference? Yep. Yeah, we've had channels hit and run harder in flathead sometimes. I so I got a last year. The wife got a flathead last year at 35 pounds. Didn't even feel like it was on there. She caught about a 12 pound channel cat. It actually pulled the rod out of the rod holder and was headed to the river. Yeah. What well, 32 pounder you caught, Tosh, that, for that tournament? It just slack lined the line. It was nothing. Yeah, there wasn't nothing to it. I thought it was a small fish. You yeah. Know? So you set the hook into it and you're like, oh, crap. <clears throat> Yeah, as soon as it got within six to eight feet, it was like, uh, never mind. My oldest daughter's uh, big blue that she caught, it was like 17 or 18 pounds. We had been messing with her the whole night. We were having a blast. She kept nodding off in the chair. Well, my cousin and I were both drinking tea. So we'd, we'd wait for her to nod off. We'd slowly pull her line back to the boat. Filled the tea jug with water, put 
put her hook in the lid and then shut the lid back and throw it back out. Uh, she, one time we actually woke her up, it was actually a fish instead of a tea bottle. Uh, <clears throat> she swore it was just an itty bitty channel. And for whatever reason, that blue just swam with her all the way back. No head shakes, no nothing. Just swam all the way up to the boat and basically put itself in the net. I've seen it happen. I mean, I've caught a fish without even hooking it. I lassoed a fish. And no joke, the hook was nowhere in the skin, nowhere nothing. The hook came around, grabbed the line. The fish swam through the lasso just like you'd set a snare. And I caught it above the dorsal and below the pectorals. I mean, no hook whatsoever. So uh, crazy things have happened. My boy did that last year. He had one wrap probably about eight or ten times around the tail. And, man, that thing was fighting like you wouldn't believe trying to get away. No, this was perfect. One wrap. Not eight or – it was one wrap, a perfect lasso. The hook literally – Perfectly grabbed the line, did not get caught on the barb, and the hook was on the belly of the fish. When we, when we pulled it in live, we pulled it in just like the Sasquatch has there. It was live in the group, and we rolled it over on its belly and showed the hook. It was nowhere. I mean, it was not a stellar fish. It was what, probably eight pounds, nine pounds? About eight pounds. Yeah, it was not where near a stellar fish, but it fought. Like a stellar fish would. <clears throat> we finally got my wife her first blue last year. She used to say that we were just sabotaging her because when we'd go fishing, everybody else would catch a blue and she'd catch pound and a half, two pound channels all night. Uh, that trip, absolutely horrible. We started out in an absolute downpour. The rain we thought had passed by the time we got to the boat ramp. We no sooner got out to put them in the water and the skies just absolutely cut loose. Get all the way down to where we were going to catch our bait. My trolling motor plug wire snapped right in half. I had didn't have big enough butt connectors for 8 gauge wire or nothing with me. So I wound up having to strip the wires back, twist them together by my with my fingers, and then electrical tape the heck out of them just to get us through the night. It, it, it was a disaster. But she finally got one that night. It was the only fish we caught all night, but it was hers. Oh, yeah. And uh, she goes, I now understand what your drive is to figure out these big blues. She goes, there's no comparison to catching channels or a blue. I was, no, a blue. I, was, I can tell the minute I pick the rod up if it's a blue or not. All I got to do is feel the head shake and I can tell you the difference. You find Flathead uh, give a little more of a fight? The only one I ever tied into really didn't fight. And that was kind of a messed up deal because we were tied off at the hot water discharge. They got a buoy line to where you can't physically go up into the discharge, but you can tie off to it and throw up into it. Yeah. There had been a boat next to us. And it was one of those nights that just made me smile because they pulled up right after we did. They were throwing the same baits we were, and we were just tearing them up. Like, we couldn't have a line in the water more than five minutes without pulling in a fish. And he could not buy a bite to save his life. What was he the difference? Take, only thing I could think of is leader length, float position. Something had to be different to where I was in a different part of the water column than he was or something. So, okay, I'll, I'll bring you back to that. So we all run our spooks the same way. We weave it, right? Yep. Do you adjust your spook a distance from the hook based on the depth you want to rise? So the way we'll start out a tournament or any fishing trip, really. For instance, hold on. Let me give you four instances. So if I'm fishing six feet of water... I try to put a nice one foot in between my spook and my hook. But if I'm fishing a four feet of water, I'll put six inches in between my spook and my hook. Do you adjust that at all? 
this. Give it here. Oh, I guess I ain't got much room in here, but that's about my average. So always about three to four inches, or you got more than that? I'm bad. I can't see it. It's about three to four inches. Uh, we'll adjust them, or if need be, a lot of times. If we're going into a tournament, we'll tie different length leaders. Uh, okay. Have some longer, some shorter. Figure out exactly where in the water column they are. So then, obviously, you, you know, all... heat of the summer, they're going to be suspended up further off the bottom. Yep. So let me ask you this then: How many of you guys use sinker slides to fixed sinkers to what I call a sliding sinker? I, I I have used sinker slides. I don't know if I just got a bad batch of them, but they were actually cutting little slivers off my line. So I, I don't know, Chris and Frenzy, just... you use sinker slides pretty heavily, don't you? Yep, that's all I run. I got something. I know here's something me and Sasquatch run that most people ain't going to run. But see the sinker? It's fixed on there, right? Like, I pull on it. It's not moving up and down my line, correct? Yep. Let me change that, though. I want to go further from my line. Now it's at the tip of it, and it's not moving. Hold on. I want to put it right by the swivel. I'm going to bring it down here. Look. Now we're right by See, the I swivel. See, I do that with, like, a bobber I put but like you a see, it doesn't that. pull on its own. So what we do is we put an overhand, a just a surgeon, overhand knot. And that'll put your sinker, it'll stabilize it and put it right where you want it. But if you want to adjust it, you can adjust your sinker to one, three, one foot or three foot just that fast. Now, I run mine. Well, I only think that works. It only works with braid. I run the paper clip looking deals off my three ways. Yeah. See, we run braid, so this only really works with braid. Yeah. But as much as we do this, I mean, look, I'm putting all that movement on my line. The guys that sit there and they want to say about the uh, spook causing friction, this right here, I think, causes more friction and more wear on my line. Than the my spook at all would ever would, and I hey, never broken other, off. It's just that other brand of spooks, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and I agree with that. I was going to get into that. If you use that double D brand of spooks, they have that flat back. So that flat back puts a natural pinch point right there. So yeah, I could see what some of those brand ambassadors are saying don't do this. I could see why they say that. But well, I mean, if you, you see would, on this type of spook. Yeah. If you use that kind of spook, you don't have a flat back at all. Where's there a pinch point at all? There's just direction changes. That's it. No I pinch mean, <clears throat> these obviously aren't Sasquatches because I haven't gotten that in, but even these are the same way. There's no yeah. flat back. And that's the yeah. thing. A spook is a spook is a spook is a spook. It's a cat call. It's a kitty call. I mean, we're not we're not bringing anything new to the industry. We're just we're reusing what we used in the late eighties, early nineties. And I mean, if you want to go real cheap, catfish sumo is off Amazon. Yeah. Yep. My paper and catfish sumo, but. <laughs> I mean, you can get spooks out there and all. You can get the foam-filled one for 69 cents, but they're foam-filled. I tell you what, I quit buying those catfish sumos because I, I started overlooking every one I would buy. And almost every one of them had a hole in it around one of the eyes. Or one of the, yeah, one of the eyelets. Yeah. No, if I'm real big. And I'm going to put it out there and... I know some people will want to argue and debate and whatnot on this, but the double D, the demon dragon, all right? Look up water dog lures. 
<laughs> water dog from Asia. I'm not going to lie, you guys. Water dog lures is what the double D is. They sell them for a dollar nineteen Sasquatch. Uh, dollar sixty six. Okay, a dollar sixty six. But if I want to buy five thousand dollars worth of them, I'm not allowed to resell them in America. So I can buy five thousand dollars worth of the double D's at a dollar sixty six. I just can't resell them. I mean, that's what the fishing industry has become. But the double D, the only thing changed is the flat back. That's the only difference in the density of the plastic. The plastic they use is a higher density plastic. And yes. in my mind, it holds less weight. Yep. I mean, I will forever. They did a, for the staff and they did anything else. A heat and on spook. This is Sasquatch spook. But this is based off a of heat and on spook. I mean, this is a Sasquatch cat call. It's based off of heat and on spook. This same design has been it out since late 80s. It's a topwater. And it's what we've all have used. So I have no idea why some company wanted to go and cut this back off and then say it's something completely different. It's not any different. Something else that we've done, just a little bit of a trick with the tournaments that we run. <clears throat> I need to rebuild this. But if you've got a fish that's being stubborn and wanting to go belly up and you're pretty certain nothing's wrong with it, clip, clip it on the on fins, fins. Yep. and it'll hold them belly down and stick them right in front of the oxygen. Yep, I've seen many, many different things like that. Which, those yeah. clips there are just Scotty clips off of some planer boards, and they don't hold on good enough. I need to get some, like, actual roach clips or something. Hey, let me know if you want in or not. I'll send you an invite. But yeah, yeah whoever. The demon right thing, it's just they came up with a different design because it looks cool. They put well, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. Down. Sasquatch, and, do you got the different design? Uh, in the truck. Okay, well, see, there's nothing wrong with that because there's always another different design to be had. Pretty good, bud. Yeah, there's always a different design. I mean, you know, and there's also here. different designs that will not add the pinch points. And I always leave home excessively prepared. I used to use a lot of Andes, man. I love Andes, but the price point on it is what kills me. Uh, Quattro C yard. These are the 50 yard spools of the leader line. And I think the place I get them from, they're like seven and a quarter for 50 yards. I used to run the slime That's line what? leader line, but it's so much cheaper. Yeah, we use C yard. How much I cost? The other one. Well, it was like forty-six bucks, maybe. I can't remember. Forty-six exactly. bucks for six hundred pound spool. Six hundred yards. Yeah. I'm not gonna run through that unless I'm pre-tying a bunch of them that we're gonna sell on the website. Hand -hand. That Quattro Sea Guard, man, I I put it hands down. It's the most abrasive resistant, and this comes from a guy, one of our friends, one of me and Sasquatch's friends who fishes big sharks off in the uh, coast of Florida. He lands 1,500 pounds sharks on these Quattro Sea Guard stuff. Now, that Sea Guard I, that he was holding up, that was green, wasn't it? Multicolored. I see it's a uh, low-biz camo. Yeah. yeah and you can get it in multi. You can get it in all the different. Blue, red. Yeah. yeah. They do. High speed does have a uh, another one that's just straight clear. I have a smaller spool of it somewhere. I don't remember where I put it though. It's like high C Grand Slam, I think is what it is. Or yeah, high C Grand Slam. And really, that's all so leader think, line is. Yeah, leader line is saltwater mono. Which and the reason well, the, I asked about the green. 
is if some if you guys go and look at some of my videos on my TikTok, you'll see why it's I either want a high vis green or a high vis orange. If I'm tied off, the way the back of my boat looks at night is freaking amazing. You use a lot of lights, right? I've got two rows of UV lights on each multi bar. Yeah. My See, entire Sasquatch rod, is the a big line, light guy too. <laughs> let's put it to you this way: If you hit my boat in the dark, it's not because you couldn't see me. <laughs> I call it a UFO. I see a UFO out there. <laughs> I haven't put a bunch of lights on this one yet. Uh, my sea nymph that I had last year, I actually had 16 foot light strips down the side, each side of it. That's what I have in my pontoon. I got them on the inside, the outside, and underneath. I've thought about trying to do something for the inside of this one, just for content purposes with night fishing and stuff. Just haven't quite decided what I want to do yet. You, so you know what I do? What's that? The me and you got the black me lights on your boat. I do on my multi bars. You can, uh, if you look on my through my TikTok videos, I've got a couple pictures that are. It, it's absolutely sweet. I just picked these ones up right there. Oh, yeah. So mine, mine are actually light strips. Now, yep. I've, wanted, I have some I've, I've thought about getting something like your, what you just showed, to angle up off the very front of my splash well, because I've got about a six-inch tall wall on the very uh, front of the splash well angle them up just to get a little bit better illumination, even though I really honestly don't need it. <clears throat> it's something else I've done. I did it to my old boat. I'm fixing to do it to this one. I take an anchor light and I bolt it to the very top of my bimini top. And I'll run the wires up through the bimini top. That way, when you're running your anchor light at night, which bugs are naturally attracted to. They're yep. way up there <clears throat> instead of down here in your face. Yeah, bugs are a pain in the ass with lights. In the <clears throat> Sasquatch likes to bring his light out, and we put it out above the bridge. But I'm more of a I like fishing in the dark. We actually had one guy that we seen, probably about the most redneck thing I'd seen on a boat. The guy had like a 14 or a 16 foot painter's extension pole. Yep. That he actually mounted a car headlight to the top of it that shined down. So it illuminated the whole inside of the boat. But when he would light it up, he'd extend it all the way up to where the light was 16 foot up and all the bugs were clear up there. Yeah, we had guys put uh, drill lights on poles up at uh, Dream Bridge last year. Kind of interesting, I'll say that. All right, there, Florida Alley Man, George Lyon. You have a good night, brother man. I hope you enjoyed it. <coughs> no, so, I, all I right, guys. Light this one up. Y'all hit that share, hit that like. We've been on here for quite some time. We got 4.9 like K likes. Hit that share, hit that like. And let's get on to the brands we endorse. We all want to endorse the brands. And I'll start out with Sasquatch because he hosts it. Sasquatch, you want to endorse yourself any? You know me. I just make the cat calls and I do the different blanks than other people do. So, you know, if you want a cat call that sounds different than everyone else's, hit me up. Or if you want to get the uh, cheaper four-packs and three-packs, I got those as well because we got the new ones in that are three packs and four packs. Three or the three packs eleven ninety nine and the four packs uh fifteen ninety nine. So under four dollars a piece, right? Then I got the huh under four dollars, four a bucks piece. a piece. Yeah, yeah. three ninety nine. 
Oh It'll yeah, three ninety nine uh, at. Gym. Yep. So Illinois, who do you want to spout out? Who do you want to support? Obviously, Sasquatch. Uh, <clears throat> really looking forward to running his stuff this year. We are also brand ambassador for Nocturnal Nation. Absolutely love the hooks. As far as in our eyes, they're the best things we've used. We've we've had a lot less issues with short strikes with them. Uh, I'm going to shout him out, even though he's not making boards at the moment. Fat Rooster Planer boards, by far the best boards we have ever pulled. I mean. 0.2, 0.3 mile an hour, and they're planed out like they should be and not trying to drag behind the boat. You get up to 0.7, they're trying to pass the boat. Uh, tangling with catfish, we don't really pro staff for them. Uh, Those are good rods. Us. I can't argue with TWC rods. I've given a couple of TWC rods away to the youth. Those are top notch. They're good rods. And I definitely can't forget Colton Howell with multi-bar. Multi-bars, there's no way to beat them. I've got the rod racks, plus I've got the cutting board mount. And I just, it's on my TikTok. I just did a, been seeing a lot of posts lately of people asking what people are running for, you know, rod racks and rod holders. So I kind of use it as a perfect opportunity to make a good video. And I'm 218 pounds, and I could literally sit on my cutting board, and that mount does not move. Uh, But like I said, TWC, go ahead. Go ahead. TWC, they don't really, we're not pro staff for them, anything like that, but they threw us a permanent discount because of what we do for veterans and... I mean, they were the first one to ever offer us anything whatsoever, and I don't foresee any reason to change after running the rods. Oh, yeah. Fishing Frenzy, who are you shouting now? I mean, I've I've been pro staff for Reaction for eight, nine years now. I've always used Reaction, so I got I to gotta hand them on the line. Um, rod-wise, I'm not pro staff through anybody, but I love my Mad Cats, but then I got my Meat hunters, I like my meat hunters too. They're good rods. Obviously, got got to shout out my hooks. You know, I can't <laughs> fishing frenzy hooks. I will shout them out. And then yeah, so on to me. I Mad Cats is the only production rod I really use. I run a lot of custom rods, a lot of surf rods, thirteen footers, fifteen footers. But uh, if I'm going to choose the production rod, I'm going to choose Mad Cats. If I'm going to choose a hook, I definitely fishing frenzy. It's all I've ever used for the last few years. Sasquatch custom lures definitely on board with that. Sasquatch custom lures, dirty South Dragon weights. I gotta love them. Dirty South Dragon weights. Trophy cat tackle right here out of, out of Ohio. PJ kicker. I mean anything I've ever asked, he goes ahead and supports. So. Those are my shout outs. Those are my call ins. But uh, in all reality, I think everybody who is in the catfish industry, who's in the catfish world, who is not bringing the drama to the table because we have a lot of that bull crap too. And there's one more that I can't forget. <clears throat> and if there's any veterans in here that want to help other veterans, hit me up on my TikTok. But you can never forget. Tackle 22 fishing and what they do for all our veterans in the country. Definitely. Definitely. 100%. Tackle 22, some great guys. Some They've caught some big fish on the um, sweet tooth pattern. He He's – I get jealous looking at their post because the quality of fish down there isn't quite where we're at yet. Yeah. Hell yeah, you guys. Well, I appreciate y'all coming on there. We got 5.3 likes. Hit them likes. We'll stay on for just a few more minutes, but I'll be honest with y'all. It's past my bedtime. (laughs) Yeah, I'm getting ready to hop off in here myself. We got company that just showed up. So So smash them likes. Hit us up. Follow us all. Illinois Blues Brothers. Fishing Frenzy Backup. 
or fishing frenzy. Sasquatch Custom Lures, fishing with the catch. Hit that like, hit that share, hit that whatever. Give us the last two minutes of your time. Make it worth our while because, well, if you got any questions, you can reach out to any of us and we'll hit you up straight up. We ain't going to like, there's no secret spots. There's no secrets in fishing. We're not going to tell you a bunch of blah, 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 bull crap. You want to catch we'll fish? We'll tell you how we like to fish, and we're not going to tell you if it's the right way or the wrong way either. So. There is no I wrong like way to fish. like us <clears throat> You know, somebody come up, man, I couldn't catch a bite all night. <clears throat> and, you know, it yeah. could be a night that we caught 20 different cats. Well, this there is what we're doing. There is no wrong or right way to fish. But Whatever catches you keep, guys fish. You know, we don't hide from all the other anglers in the tournament what we're running. You want to look at our rods? Look at them. Yeah. Go for it. We put on social media. Everything I run, you can follow along. You can tie the same knots. You can do whatever we do. Now, I do have a friend that was always going live on TikTok that runs our tournament. And I'm not going to lie. He kicked my butt every single tournament. But he actually quit going live on TikTok because everybody else from the series was hopping on his live. And from that point on, he could never fish his spot again because everybody would beat him there. They knew where he was. All they had to do I was mean, look at his surroundings. It, it's no it secret I mean, a 30-foot pontoon lit up with lights. Everybody knows where I'm at, so... You can't hide. Yeah, or if you get guys from two hours away saying, oh, we're going to go smoke the tournament fish in Dream Bridge, <laughs> you realize you got 30 locals who are going to be at Dream Bridge before you're able in the county. Yep. I mean, we live on this island. I just find it hilarious when these guys are like, oh, I'll go win this tournament. I'll just go fish Dream Bridge. I'm like, dude, you got a two-hour drive, and we got 50 people that are already there. Well, I think it's funny <clears throat> because I have a specific place that I like to tournament fish. It's an area that we call the flats and it's pretty much the same depth all the way across and it's width from bank to bank. It's all the same. And for whatever reason, it is an absolute hot spot. We can, and there's a lot of times we'll, we'll leave it for the end because we got other spots we like too, but we can be the only ones there. And I guarantee you within 30 minutes of us starting to fish it, we'll get swarmed. Hey, Sasquatch sounds familiar, right? Uh, what? <laughs> we'll fish at Dream Bridge and within our first post, our first catch, or even with somebody we're fishing with like Cat Eyes. Corey that we're fishing with, or Rush Creek Bait that we're fishing with, or any if any of the guys we're fishing with at Dream Bridge, they make a catch, they post it. Yeah, within an hour or two, you got everybody and their mother trying to park in places they can't park, trying to fish spots they, they have no rights to fish. And yeah, it's it's comical at times. It really is. Now, I don't know if this makes me cocky, but I'm gonna ask anyway. Does anybody else take pleasure of being in a tournament with a boat and literally trolling past somebody that's been anchored off all day that's caught nothing? And just as you go by them, your rods start getting slammed and you start pulling in fish? Well, I mean, We've no more cocky lot. than I am when I pull in a 30-pounder in front of 80 boats that can't catch anything, and I'm sitting on the bank. I outfish boat fishermen... I mean, I, I don't want to co sound cocky myself. I will go out against any boat fisherman on Indian Lake. I'll fish from the bank. They can fish from their boats. I will catch bigger fish. Been proven. I've done it against Darren. I've done it against a few guys. I'll catch bigger fish from the bank all day long. But I have private permission to some places that most people won't have access to. So there is kind of my key. Uh, that was hell. Yeah. I can go to places like uh, Governor's Island or the tip of Mini Walk, and I can go to places where you're not going to be able to fish. 
unless you're a local here. So that is my key. That is kind of my thing. But yeah, I, I don't think boat fishermen on Indian Lake, on Indian Lake, on my home body of water, I don't think boat fishermen have any benefit. Many, many, many of our catfish tournaments have been won from the bank. And a lot of people, I think, I've noticed they all rely on the fish finder. Well, on our lake, like the I said, our average, finder. ours is typically, I'll say 15 to 20 pounds. We'll get a, some 30s here and there that'll come in. But even the 15 to 18s that we typically catch, nine times out of 10, I never marked it on the fish finder. Yep. You can't always yeah. go by what's coming across the fish finder. I am a 100% anti-electronics, anti-fish finder, anti-everything. I honestly believe you will focus too much on that screen. You will miss the ripples on the top of the water. And Sasquatch will tell you, when that ripple, when that seam moves out from my house, I notice it, I reel in, I cast out. When the seam moves into my house, I reel in, I restage my bait. I'm not looking at a fish finder. I'm looking at the water in which I'm fishing. Now, <clears throat> I, I will say I use it in the aspect to where if your bait balls are close to the bottom, you're wasting your time. There ain't nothing there. Now, if your bait balls are, are great up for and cast nets, cast netting are. bait, fish finders are great. So if you want to have fish finders so that way you can cast net your bait, I think you're 100% on cue. But, but if I, you got I'll, a sea arc and you're doing down scope, live imaging, pan optics, and you are looking for catfish in general, you're going to focus too much time on fish that will not bite. That's just. Now, I will say, I will use it to help find the big drops and drag that's my baits along the drops. Yeah. We watch it from the bottom. We might watch more for structure. And you look for structure. Yep. And we can, we've caught more fish that were never on the screen than any time we've ever seen fish on the screen. Yeah. I agree with that 100%. Same thing yeah. with shad. We shad we use it to to cast net for shad if they're on the top. They're easy to get. If not, I mean we got a big spotlight on the front of the boat. I turn on the spotlight, the shad comes to light anyway. Yeah. Uh, man, we yeah, got that's six point three thousand. Hit that, that likes. Hit that likes. Let's get us up to seventy five hundred likes real quick. My old boat, I actually had a light bar on the front of it. But our lake gets so foggy at night in the summer because of the water temperature that there's nights you got to shut all your lights off and literally look through the fog bank and look at the tree lines to see where you're at, which is yeah, that, another reason I have here. the fish finder I do. I love I got, because I've got mapping. I got six they're, forward facing pods, so the, you can see it coming. <laughs> There was actually one night, and this is back when I had the utmost cheapest hummingbird fish finder you could buy. I think it's the Piranha 5 or something. They're like less than 100 bucks. I was trying to make my way back. I thought I was going straight down the center of the lake. Next thing I knew, I was all a 15 foot from shore getting ready to beach the boat, which is when I decided I was going to upgrade to the Helix series. That's got mapping. That way, I can actually just look at my fish finder and tell that I'm actually in the middle of the lake. Yeah, dude, I know so many guys that have fish finders and whatnot. They don't even know how to operate them. They literally just use it for like GPS. They're like, okay, I caught a fish here, and they hold the marker there, and then they go back to there. They don't have yeah, to operate perfect. anything other than that. I, I have done that. Uh, I've actually got quite a few marks for, like, there's a shelf that I can fish off of that flat on the one side. And I, and this, I won't just, oh, I caught one fish, I'm going to mark it. 
if it's a spot that's consistent every time I go, I'll drop a pin there. But if it's just one fish, I'm not just going to drop a pin just to drop a pin. You don't want to see my dad's fish finder because it's got every stump and every rock pile, everything. 335 million G spot. But that's also because he's a bass fisherman. So. <laughs> Bait fisherman yeah, we'll, is what we'll I call him. Well and structure and stuff like that. If there's something in the river we don't want to hit, I'll mark that more before I do a fish. And there it is. That's what I was looking for. Cat fishermen will mark obstructions that they want to avoid more yep. than they'll mark where they want to fish. So my teammate you can mark last year, we were flying across the lake going down to the power plant. And there's a section of that lake that gets shallow. I didn't even know the stump was there. And we're both coming across the lake wide open. I got through just fine. He was... I don't know, four foot off of my path and slammed an under underwater stump. High centered his boat. I mean, it pays to know where stumps are at. Yeah. Yeah, there's a stump right out. There's three stumps right out in front of our seawall, and uh, the harvesters don't even know where they're at. So it is definitely beneficiary. Oh, we've what? got a First... lot of hours of just driving and watching the bottom. And I can I can go down to our farthest point of the river from where we're at. And I can watch my fish finder and drive my boat back by watching the fish finder and watching the bottom. I don't even have to look where I'm going. I can just jump by the bottom. Oh, uh, yeah. Tosh disappeared. No, I'm still here. <laughs> Anybody else got uh, anything else to say? What's your favorite snail knot? Do I really got to explain this to you? <laughs> I only tie one snell, so and it's the same one you did the other night. All right, so if you're running a hook that has a sleeve over the eyelet, you want to make sure your sleeve is covering covering three quarters or half of your eyelet. I know you run Nocturnal Nation, and we run Fishing Frenzy. They all have very similar sleeves over the eyelets. I have found through years of run, not, running Nocturnal Nation that their sleeves is not high enough for the snail I use, and also the sleeve is not thick enough. I pop them. So I order my hooks from Glenn, and I ask Glenn one thing. I want that sleeve to cover three quarters of the reveal. That is my difference, and that is what we offer. I'm there's. I, I'm not saying anyone's better than the other. What I'm saying, if I could have that whole loop at the top completely covered, I will take a hot pin and poke it through the rubber, and that's where all time I smell. So, for me. Personally, that sleeve, the higher it is, the better it is. Yeah, but you also use the uh, more traditional style snail knot. Yes, I yes, use a completely... There is a huge difference in height. Yes, there is. And that is where, that is, I, I when I met with Glenn, I was in negotiations with Glenn and Nocturnal Nation at the same time. And I kept popping my Nocturnal Nation hooks because I do try, I do tie, I, what is it, a no knot snail? No, yeah, that's what I. I don't know the name of my knot. Those guys know the name of my knot. It's a no knot snail, I, I believe. 
I've been using a no-knot snail, which is more that style. Yeah. You use more, uh, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but you do the loop in the back, and then you wrap it, and then you go back to oh, yeah. the I use the original snail. Yeah. And I find that if I can have half of my eyelid completely covered, that's perfect. I get no burn, I get no rub, but I, I'm also tedious. I change out my my leader. I like to say every fish I catch, but in all reality, I change it out every night. I mean, and I'll when I work up and down this, I see there's some fray right there, there's some fray right there, and there's some fray right down there. So when I go in the spring, I'm not going to use this leader, but... I make sure I inspect my stuff. I'm a quality inspector by field. So I make sure I inspect my leader and my gear before I go fish with it. Here's and that's another like good a big question thing to me. Too. What kind of knots does everybody run from their leader line to their main line? Polymer to the swivel. Or I'm going to I'm gonna re release a little secret. I'm going to try... One rod with no swivel this year. I'm going to use a double uni. Based on Jeffrey Weaver. Jeffrey Weaver, the shark cat fisherman of the world. He's telling me a double uni is what I want to run so that way I can eliminate my uh, my swivel. You want to use an FG, not, not a double uni. Yeah. Also, I've also been told in the trolling world the swivel is beneficial because it allows your bait to move more and yes. gives it a more realistic look. Yes, it allows it to swivel and allows it to spin without getting line tangle. Yeah. I see I voted for channel cats if you if you're channel cat fishing and you're using mono with no swivel, it'll all tangle up from the channel cat's barrel rolling. But I don't yeah. get that with brain. <coughs> My brain doesn't do that, but only the mono will. Yep. Another issue I have with braid, and not that it happens very often, but let's be honest, most of us are throwing bait casters. It happens. I hate bait casters. They're dumb. <laughs> I'll get over that. Uh, I would much rather pick a backlash out with mono than braid. Any day, I agree with. I'll agree with that. I will agree. if you're using a bait caster, you want to run mono. Uh, my cousin, I'm sorry, Jason, if you're watching, by far worst backlash we had it all last year. So, my sea nymph had had everybody said it looked like I was going across the lake with a chop top because it was a real short bimney top. He went to go cast, and his hook perfectly wrapped around the front bar as he come forward. And he about backlashed that thing to the center of the reel, and we were still able to save it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we do that with our poles. Like, I, I got seven kids, so when you get six out of the seven casting on the boat, they go over each other. The only good thing about... I have reaction line in about nine different colors. So it's not bad to untangle it with that many colors. But if you tangle two or three poles of the same color, you might as well cut your losses and cut it. Yep. And we've had some tangles too in between our, when we fish out on the banks and yeah, tangles are no fun. There's especially when you get in with the braid, you're not, you're not untangling the braid. You're cut. A couple of colors isn't too bad, but you tangle two of the same colors. I cut my losses. I cut it and go on. Yeah. Well, it's like with us, we all run green line. And one of the worst messes we have had, we had a good blue take one of the outside planer boards, and that thing shot straight across every other rod we had and tangled all four rods together. Had that happen many, many, many a time. Here's a question for all of you. How often do you refool your poles? Every, every, every couple spring, months, dude, if not every midway month. Midway through the season. Hello, how are you? 
whenever I get bored. I have so many poles, honestly. I will <laughs> honestly, if I'm not restringing a pole, I'm using a pole I haven't used. I mean, I'm kind of. If I take you outside, I got 50 catfish setups in my element. So I, I'm not reusing the same stuff often. I've got four TWCs for myself. My wife has a the pink and purple mad cat. She's got a green hell Carol. cat. <clears throat> and then my daughter has a uh, the white and red TWC spin cast. And that thing with that dial up, I throw a two ounce sinker on that. And I swear to God, I could sit there and just listen to an entire song before it ever hits the water. Yep. <clears throat> and that was something else I learned big time once I started getting big into the catfishing was the type of pole you use to whatever reel you are using makes a world of difference in performance. I, I can't disagree with that. You want long casts? Go get yourself a shim And this is for the bait runners, not a bait caster. Go get a Shimano 6000, a Shimano 8000, a CMAR 55 or a CMAR 65. Throw it on a 7.6, any catfish rod, whether it's Mad Cats, Hangling with Catfish, Hellcat. Well, Hellcat don't make spin. Any spinner. You throw it on there with a nice, good, solid body, even a pen, a, CN, a CMMN solid body reel. Your casting distance greatly improves. Now, like, I'll take my daughter's pole if I'm going to that hot water discharge and I want to throw it absolutely as far up into it as I can. Because the current in there is strong enough. Typically, I'm throwing about a five-ounce sinker. So you throw a five-ounce sinker on that dial with spin cast and you'll about empty it out. Oh, yeah. Alrighty, guys. Well, I'm I'm beat. Most y'all, oh, well, I work my ass off. So, uh, I appreciate Illinois Blue Brothers. I thank you for coming on. Nice to meet you, my friend. Same to Fishing you. frenzy, man. Glenn, you do it up for me every time you can. Sasquatch, he's out there leading the way on the other end. So I appreciate you also. But uh, let's head this off with uh. What's our inspiration for catfishing? A quick one minute and one second. My inspiration for catfishing is I want to see kids catch fish as big as they are. And kids can't catch fish as big as they are unless they are catfishing. So what's your inspiration, Sasquatch? Camaraderie. Uh, that's great work. What about you, um, uh, Fishing Frenzy? I basically agree with both of you guys. I mean, the kids out there and the camaraderie, that's what it's about. All right. Illinois Blues, Blues Brothers, that leaves it up to you. You like the veterans. What's it to you? I mean, a big part of it for me is the veterans and the, the enjoyment they get out of the fight. Uh, camaraderie is a huge thing, which kind of goes hand in hand with what we do with the veterans. Yep. Uh, we've built great relationships with several of them. I think a couple of them get butt hurt if we don't invite them out when we're going fishing. Uh, and a lot of it too, I gotta say, is my dad because I grew up cat fishing with him when I was a kid. And ever since I moved back to the area we lived when I was a kid, that's all I could think about and all I wanted to do. And well, now I'm addicted to it. Yeah, and catfishing was not around 20 years ago like it is now. That's the thing that boggles my mind. I was catfishing Indian Lake when we had screamers or yellow bellies. That was the majority, screamers, yellow bellies, and channels. That was the majority of what we caught. But now that we're catching flatheads, I really have to ask myself, 
is that all we caught because that's the only gear we ran? Because a lot of us broke off on streamers and yellow bellies. I mean, I'll tell you what, <clears throat> yellow belly bullheads, you get the little bitty ones, about yep. six to eight inches. Flatties love them. Oh, yeah. That's oh, yeah. our go to bait here for spawn. If, if nothing's biting during spawn, you put bullhead on, you'll tear them up. Yep. Well, that was like I mean, us during spawn because we had tournaments during the spawn. Nobody could figure out why they weren't catching. They were all throwing cut bait. Even trolling. Throw on a live bluegill while you're trolling during the spawn, and you yep. will have 10 times the success you will with cut bait. How many people ever brought in a bass or something with the eyes plopped out of its head during spawn? I can't say I've done that, but I have caught bass catfishing from the bank with cut bait. So I've caught a lot of bass during spawn because I'll use different baits. And what I find is the bass, the eyes are popped out of their heads. They're blowed out. What that is, is that's the flathead or the catfish smacking them when they come into the nest, but not eating them. They're not there to eat them. They're there to smash them and get them away. So a lot of times they hit them so hard that, yeah, their eyes pop out, their cloacia pops out, and they're blowed out. But then, you know, six to eight months later, they, they're just normal fish. Well, I appreciate y'all for coming on, and thank you very much. Illinois Blues Brothers... Tightline solid hook sets, fishing frenzy, tightline solid hook sets, Sasquatch. See you tomorrow. Tightline solid hook sets. See you tomorrow. Have, have a good night, everybody. Toodles. See you guys. Bye. See ya. <laughs>